In the wake of an underwhelming fan opinion of the Imola sprint race, Formula One and the FIA have ploughed on with plans to extend the format to six Grand Prix weekends for 2023. First introduced in 2021, the format was met with, mi with mixed opinion, despite its dramatic consequences on the three Grand Prix that followed each Saturday sprint. This year, 2022, the format has been held at Imola already and will be run again in Australia, in Austria and in Brazil. Welcome to a special episode of the Five Red Lights F1 podcast. My name is Aaron Harper. In today's episode, I'll be discussing the sprint format, its value to the Grand Prix, Ross Braun's inflammatory response to criticism, and potential fixes for the format. As I said, this is a special episode, so I needed a guest to fit it. I'm joined by Ash from the outside line. How are you doing, Ash? I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much for coming on. What is the outside line and where can we find it? Um, so the outside line is on YouTube. It is uh, my channel and it, it it's kind of uh, become a, a, almost a nostalgia trip. It's kind of playing back through old F1 games and also old racing games, uh, looking back through old motorsport stories. Uh, and I do a little bit of modern stuff sprinkled in here and there as well. Um, but yeah, it, at the minute I'm going through F1 97, already done the original F1 game for PlayStation. I've just started a playthrough of Gran Turismo 3 as well. So I'm, I'm on YouTube and uh, yeah, uh, hopefully uh, people will find it. Brilliant. Brilliant. So you did your first uh, playthrough as uh, Jean Alessi. So I suppose it's only right that the first question for you is uh, which driver on the current grid, do you, current grid do you think is most like Jean Alessi? OK, so I've, I've had a think about. Well, to be fair, as soon as I, that question got put to me, I thought there's one driver that stood out in my mind. And then I ran through my work and I thought, I actually think it fits. So John Lacey as a driver was very fiery. He had a lot of talent. Um, he wasn't always on it 100 percent. I feel like he had his good days and bad days. And sometimes the wind had to be blowing in the right direction for him to be really on his top form. In the same breath, he was also incredibly unlucky and didn't really get, I think, what he deserved out of the sport. Ended up with only one race win at the end, but it was also pretty much universally liked. For me, if you take those things and remove them from John Lacey and throw them at the current grid, for me, they all stick to Pierre Gasly. Because he's one race win, very likable, very talented, unfairly treated at Red Bull, is starting to get a little bit of what he deserved. But at the same time, he isn't always like... You don't immediately think this guy should be world champion immediately, but you think, well, actually, in the right circumstances, he could do really well. So I think, yeah, I think Pierre Gasly is, is John Lacey. Yeah, that's a that's a really good shout, actually. What, your reasoning for it is really it's really good. I thought you were going to go with uh, Daniel Ricciardo because when you yeah. said really liked, I was like, there's only one guy who isn't a world champion who should probably have won some more races. Daniel Ricciardo but Pierre Gasly is a really good shout and there's that that French parallel between them as well so it'd be interesting to see if Pierre can build on what he's done in the in a way that Jean didn't manage to yeah hopefully it's well it's what happens from Alpha Tauri is he going to ever get back into Red Bull or is there going to be another good drive somewhere else I'll give you that though Daniel Ricciardo is a great shout because he's got the fieriness as well so that's also an equally good a good shout as well Maybe we're seeing a lot more drivers like Jean Lacey because he was a bit of a trailblazer in, in that respect. People taking to him and modelling themselves on him because he, he definitely had the talent and he should have definitely won more races. He was severely unlucky, especially in Monaco 96. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, there's there's a few where you think, how have you not ended up with more? Now, that's got to be the most painful one, though, to be leading and then just, yeah, completely out of your hands. Just I uh, think it was suspension that went yeah awful yeah. let's bring things back to the present i think well maybe john lacy would have been a good uh driver in the sprint race because he was excellent at getting the car off the line some of his starts were were meteoric uh to use a word that murray walker may have used about one of his starts from time to time so how was the sprint format born well ross braun spoke of wanting to create a grand slam for uh for grand prix weekends featuring the sprint races and the quote I've got is, we want to give fans engagement throughout the weekend. We want to lift up the engagement on a Friday and a Saturday. And I suppose it does do that because it, it moves qualifying to a Friday and it has something as well on a Saturday. So you've got something on each day of the weekend. I mean, how do you feel the format works in its current guise? In terms of the engagement, yeah, okay, absolutely. I can't, that's one of the things I'm, I'm, 
I kind of agree with. It's the point that, okay, if you're going to get rid of a practice session and have another race, cool. And then every single day has a session that's got some jeopardy to it. So qualifying on the Friday, there's some points at stake, and then it sets the grid for Sunday. So I do appreciate that side of it. From there, that's where I kind of struggle with it, but because I think it slightly devalues qualifying on a Friday. Um, and there's still constant arguments about, you know, how do you, you, do you get pole position from being fastest in qualifying? Or do you get pole position? Because apparently you don't get pole position from being it. You do know you do get pole position. You get, you get awarded being, it in the record books. Yeah, for being fast. Sunday, but you could let, you could start third but have yeah. pole position in the. Which so make yeah, any sense? Absolutely. So in in that sense, I think that's where it falls down. I think the trying to mix it with qualifying is is an issue for me. I think if it was just a sprint race in the F two sense. I think it would work a lot better. I yeah. think it's the fact they've tried to make this through line through the weekend and make it affect qualifying where I, I kind of struggle with it. Yeah, they, they've tried to join everything together to keep it all sort of linear, but they're almost getting in their own way in that respect because, like you say, once you qualified fastest, and we saw this with uh, the sprints last year, the guy who actually set the fastest lap time in qualifying on Friday never actually started the Grand Prix from pole position yeah. so it was it was a bit bizarre and in in lewis hamilton's case in brazil he set the fastest lap time and started the sprint last for yeah you know whatever reasons so the, the sprints in 2021 were were interesting because they were an experiment everyone knew what they were they were sort of a trial and then okay well, there's probably more to come in 2022 with some more changes maybe it look a little bit different but the format is very much the same and we've already had one uh in the last race at Imola now just for anyone sort of watching or listening to this we are recording this between practice and qualifying for the Miami Grand Prix so anything we we say here could drastically age very badly um what was your assessment of the Imola sprint um it was probably the weakest of the ones they've held so far um, I think we kind of knew that going in, though, when we saw what tracks they were going to and we saw Imola and thought it's not the most overtaking friendly circuit, considering the size of these cars now. And it's still quite, you know, a tight track. Um, it was mostly done in DRS. And the thing is, on paper, it, you know, when you describe it back to someone, oh, there was a change for the lead, you know, between the two championship rivals. It sounds really great, but actually it was a couple, it was a DRS move and it was, it was fine. It was okay. But what it also did was undermine what was an interesting order from the grid on Friday. Now, Will Buxton kind of said, well, if we'd had a qualifying on Saturday, you wouldn't have had that order, which is kind of a fair point, but we did and it got ruined. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you gave us an interesting scenario and then you kind of took it away from us over a, few hundred kilometers um yeah. so it, it it kind of undid a lot of the stuff that we'd want to see in the race so it yeah it was the weakest one of the, the lot for me yeah I, I fully agree with that i mean the the battle for the lead was tense and that's interesting that is always a plus point for any race whether a sprint or a grand prix or whether it's qualifying you won that battle for pole position but lower down the order it was all just signs and perez DRS drive buying their way through the field from uh, 10th and 7th at that beginning point of the sprint. And then you had drivers, um, well, Magnussen started on the mediums while everyone else was on the soft. And he was just backing people up when he then it ended up falling down the order. So all of his good work on Friday had completely gone to waste. So like you say, it took something away from that potential narrative on the Sunday. Could he have held? Could they have then maybe changed some things for the Grand Prix and held on to that fourth place? You know, if there'd been a collision at the front, Magnussen could have found himself leading the race in a Haas, which you know, if he'd said at the end of last year, that that would have just sounded crazy. But I think Imola, like you say, was a, a, a not necessarily a silly choice, but a poor choice for a sprint race. But again, going back to that trial element, it's worth seeing how it functions on a track like that mm -hmm. if it's possible with the the drs and the way the new cars are able to follow much better but i think we found out that it, it didn't quite work as well as people had hoped 
DRS either too powerful or not powerful enough in some respects and certain cars jumping up and down too much didn't help. So, um, yeah, I mean, building on that, we had some comments from Ross Braun reacting to George Russell saying that he wasn't really a big fan of the, the format. And just as things started to get interesting, the checkered flag came out, which in some ways, George, George's assess, assessment of that was correct because you could see that there was just something brewing in the midfield and it was about to come to a head and then we wanted to stop, which is a little bit like getting to Christmas morning, seeing all your presents and being told you can't open them until New Year's Day. So it just sort of prolongs that, that uh, anticipation and that excitement. Now, Ross Braun said that the opinion of anyone at the back of the grid is not an opinion we listen to. And that, that in, it, in itself is not a good look for Formula One. No, it's it really wound me up that, to be honest. Um, you know, not not too long ago, I'd actually listened through Ross Braun's audio book, Total Competition, and he talked about his time in F1, and really fascinating. But it also sh- it showed a picture of a man who was very pragmatic, who is kind of very open to kind of change and collaboration, um, and, you know, but also at the same time, a very competitive, you know, looking to kind of get the advantage legally, being able to find the loopholes and rules, all that stuff. Brilliant. As since he's become the head of F1, I, I feel like there's been a change in him. The first problem, I think, is obviously he was brilliant in a competitive situation where he's vying amongst other people. Here, he is not competitive he's become his own Bernie as it were he was obviously used to working with Bernie Eccleston he's not competing against anyone he's leading the way so he has to be a bit more open to kind of outside influence I think than maybe he was used to than when running a team he you know the teams are not his enemies anymore they it's kind of all worked together to make it better and he's been very kind of standoffish um, about kind of suggesting anything that his kind of uh, uh, suggestions are poor. The other thing is I just, as someone who's kind of been in F1 for so many years, through so many eras, I don't see where he's coming from with some of his comments. Like you mentioned, he wanted kind of a grand slam feel to kind of have these almost like, you know, the four grand slams of tennis have these big events stand out as everyone wants to win the sprints. Um, but the problem is it just makes, it, it kind of detracts from it. It just makes the, everything over a race weekend feel a little bit more disjointed. Um, and then he also said something along the lines of, I think it was, you know, younger people don't want to watch long races. And it's like, come on, Ross, actually speak to some some people. Don't just make these snap judgments because, you know, you see people on the TikTok and, and stuff. And it, it's just, you know, it just see as such an out of touch comment. and. I don't know why he seems to have closed down a little bit from kind of listening to other people. It's, it's very odd. Um, so it really wound me up when he said that, cause like you should be listening to, to everyone on the grid, your drivers, you know, they're the people out there putting themselves out there and you should listen to them for, for everything. Um, but also the fans as well. And the amount of people saying, yeah, we're not, we're not really into this or there's something not, at least something not quite working about it. And then it's just deaf ears. And it's it's part of a wider problem, I think, in F1. Yeah, it, it certainly does reflect a worrying sort of trend. And we're seeing that sort of narrative spell itself out over this weekend in Miami. So there's just a few things that I've sort of noted down. That are fairly recent, there's been some complaints about the disciplinary system following um, Hamilton and Verstappen's disqualification and fine in Brazil uh, for their different well Hamilton for his rear wing breaking while he was on track no fault of his own for Stappen for then touching said rear wing uh then we've had the Saudi Arabia incident which we'll mm. sort of just leave at that um where the drivers sort of took a stand we've had the safety car described as a turtle and then that thrown back at the driver's faces but then you know we do have you know in the in the most tragic possible sense uh potentially legitimate example of the safety car not going fast enough in the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, which arguably has contributed to the Etten Senna crash. And then this weekend, 
all anyone can seem to talk about off the track is how much jewelry drivers are wearing and what their underpants are. I mean, this is kind of crazy. And the FIA are tending to sort of rebuff any claims that are disputable. And it doesn't leave them in a good light, especially off the back of Abu Dhabi. I, mean, I can see sort of where the two new race directors are coming from with the jewellery and the underpants thing, you know, it's got to be by the book. But certain things that need a little bit more nuance and a little bit more, like you say, collaboration, and especially someone like Ross Braun should be aware of the fact that to get things achieved, you have to work with the FIA, not work against them. Because for years and years and years, he was the one trying to find the loopholes, the double diffuser, the whatever it was on the Ferrari that made the Ferrari amazing. And then for him to then hop to the other side and behave in this way, sometimes it does, like you say, fit, make him feel a little bit out of touch. But I think also it's a wider problem within F1 and how Liberty Media want themselves to be seen and the FIA want themselves to be seen. And it, it just doesn't quite string everything together, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, it's and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the FIA or, or Ross is wrong in everything. For example, I, I think you rate the, the stuff about the safety car. You know, the safety car's been too slow for a long time. And I think there's there's a certain, you know, point with that where it's like, okay, I understand why the drivers are complaining it does need to go quicker, but at the same time, the safety car used to be like a, a even worse than an Aston Mine. It wasn't like an a Citroen or something like really slow. It so was like it's an average it's, road car, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, I, you know, this is the stuff like that. It's like, that's what it is. You know, we're not just going to kit out, say the, the, um, the model car and have that be your safety car sort of flashing lights on your, <laughs> your spec car. And that, that can go around at like full speed. No, it's not the place to kind of slow things, but no, it's when it's this, the lack of being able to take things on a case by case basis where something gets leveled at them and they don't go, right, let's look at this. Are we wrong? Do we need to kind of address this? It is just a blanket. It's fine. F1 is the, the pinnacle of motorsport and the greatest show on earth, and everything is fine. It's everything just that meme, is isn't it? The house on fire and the dog sitting in the chair. <laughs> it is. It absolutely yeah. is. And it's so frustrating because it's like, guys, just admit when this is, you know, you've made a mistake because it's more, I personally find that more... Um, respectable and i will like it more if they turn around and admit when they've gone down an alley but it's just a really weird thing in and around f1 where it seems like you can't criticize it like you used to get it back in the day when when people who covered it on on tv would openly criticize f1 if something was wrong now it feels like no one on sky ever wants to outwardly say if they want to criticize it it's always kind of well i'm not sure if that was the best but i'm sure there's a re you know what i mean there's no one will say when something's wrong will buxton i mean for crying out loud i you know i don't want to again say i i dislike everything will buxton says like everyone like myself probably in this podcast i will say things that are right wrong i'll look back at things and change my opinion and so on but i feel like no matter what will buxton says whether it's right or wrong is always yes f1 you know what i mean it's just yeah. and this is the problem it's just like creating this weird slightly right wingy feel where it's like everything has to be great don't ever say anything's wrong god forbid and that's why so many problems persist in the sport um and don't get me wrong in the grand scheme of things sprint qualifying and, and what happens with it, it's probably quite minor consistencies with the application of rules is, is the one that sticks out for, for me not just from that big one last year but throughout seasons before and it's that lack of being able to kind of you know take that on the chin and go you know what we made a mistake here um so let's lack of, adapt it's the lack of being able to sort of be self-critical and analyze i mean the big the big one obviously is abu dhabi and where the fia essentially marks their own homework but they're, they're setting the homework and they're writing their own homework and then they get to market it's just a bit and like you say pundits are not coming out and being completely honest with their opinions mm -hmm. which does sort of dilute the quality of the show and you, you want people to be really sort of out there and outspoken and say what they think. I mean, we had Juan Pablo Montoya on the Sky um, coverage of practice 
and he was saying some really sensible things and I was worrying that he'd, he'd bumped his head because that wasn't the Juan Pablo Montoya that I grew up watching you know he you know he'd, there's a videos of him because it's just YouTube but he bumps into a cameraman and you know it's it's entirely Juan Pablo's fault but it still makes the cameraman feel terrible about it but you know and those those sort of characters you you need those on tv to be able to say what they they think and almost just keep the fia in check because the fia and formula one are big corporations and you can't always expect them to manage themselves appropriately and in the right way so if people just sort of keep sort of pointing the finger at them and just making them aware that they need to be conducting themselves correctly that that is completely fair i would say because as long as no one is speaking out of turn then everyone has right to to sort of criticize and everyone should be open to criticism and constructive criticism and, and these comments that Ross Braun made in the wake of the, the sprint and what George Russell said what Russell wasn't being outwardly derogatory about the sprint he just said I'm not I'm not a big fan of it you know he's the one having to compete in it and obviously he's on on the back of a, a poor result but you know, he's had now four races in the sprint where he's probably been stuck at the back. Well, actually, he was in the midfield at Silverstone because he performed heroics in that Williams. So, you know, that they're the sort of people you want to be getting a, an idea from because they're spending 100 kilometres racing everybody else. If you just sort of, sort of uh, coordinate off to people at the front, they're not really racing each other. You know, we saw in Silverstone, uh, Verstappen and Hamilton, they dueled for the first lap. They didn't crash and uh, then they didn't really get too close to each other. So the FIA does need to be open to that sort of thing. And it does leave a lot to be desired. So it, it does, like you say, does mean that the FIA need to sort of conduct themselves properly. Now, a question we've got to ask ourselves is, does the sprint add value to the Grand Prix? And to do that, we need to have a look at the real reason the sprints came about. And you mentioned earlier about Ross Braun saying that uh, younger fans like to watch a shorter race. They find that more appealing. I think that's a misguided belief. What do you think? I completely agree it's misguided. It is it is a generalisation that, you know, attention spans of younger people are just, you know, they only want to watch Instagram reels and TikToks and they want really short form content. They're not interested anymore in films and races that last over, you know, half an hour, it, you know, and it's a really misguided belief. And the amount of uh, younger F1 fans who, you know, are on Twitter after those comments said, you're you don't know what you're talking about um so it's a very strange a very strange thing to me um and I, I think one of the real reasons was at the time when this idea came about it was before the new regs were coming in they'd already announced that the regs were coming we knew this was going to happen um but they were just desperate to have some more overtaking action in the interim and before the sprints came in in like 2020 um uh, sorry, 2021, but they, they were announced in 2020. That season was still very much the Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes show with maybe a little bit of a stap in, in there. And I feel like it was just a, a quick plaster over the situation of we don't have good racing action or a tight field. So let's try and do something to, to, to try and mix it up. And to me, I don't understand why, A, with the regs coming, they didn't just wait. And B, now the regs are here. Do we really still need it like i i don't think so i think it was just kind of trying to shove a plaster over a wider problem i'm still open to it because obviously like you say if we're going to get rid of a practice session for another race cool maybe just not in its its current guys um but yeah I, it's nonsense the, the the shorter shorter attention span thing is just nonsense yeah that doesn't make any sense because I, i've been watching formula one since i was five years old so you know you can't tell me that yeah, and that was when overtaking was at a premium uh, back in the, sort of the mid 2000s and Schumacher was winning everything. So you can't tell me that younger fans don't uh, want a longer race. The thing like what you say is that the, the, the FIA and Formula One have tried to plaster over something. If the product is good and if young people are stimulated in the right way, like, Obviously, you're a parent, so you, you will understand this 
completely if you put on something that interests your child on the tv if you put on their favorite tv show they will sit there for hours and hours and hours and watch it and you can just get on with what you need to do yeah if you put on something uh like normal daytime tv and just plonk them in front of the so in front of the tv on the sofa they'll be up and moving around within 20 seconds because they don't want to watch that so it's about how you stimulate your audience and like we've seen at Monaco where it's really processional people switch off because nothing's happening. And we watch a Grand Prix or a, a race, any formula, because we want to see action. We want to see close racing and competition. And I think the sprint, it does add some value to the Grand Prix in that sense, because it adds that extra layer of competition and that opportunity. And we saw this sort of play itself out in, especially at Silverstone where Hamilton and Verstappen sort of suss each other out in the first uh, sprint and then it all came to a head on the Sunday Lewis didn't back down if we hadn't had the sprint Verstappen would have won the race because Hamilton would have had to back out because he wouldn't have wanted to risk a crash so yes the sprint does add value in that sense but it does take away because it like with Imola it takes away the narrative and like you say do we need them with the current regulations that is something that we have to ask ourselves and obviously we're very early in these regulations why not continue to experiment with it yeah i mean absolutely i think like i say as much as i don't think the way it's been implemented now is is the way there's no reason why they can't tweak it and have another go and there's, there's other things they can do um i, I think i said in, I, in my video from around silverstone last year um, just remove it from qualifying, take the ball out of qualifying and have it as a sprint race. Um, I know that there seems to be a, a real kind of um, aversion to a complete reverse grid race in Formula One. Um, to me, I think there's, there's a, a good um, sort of middle ground to that. I, I think I suggested like have the sprint race just be its own race. It doesn't affect what happened in qualifying or the race but then you reverse the grid down to Q1. So Q1 is still at the back. You don't get like a free pass for being awful in Q going straight out. They're still at the back, but then from Q2 upwards, it's reverse grid. So essentially I think it's 15th that is going to be on pole, 14th and so on down there. And then you use an older point system. So there's a bit more risk reward. So um, either whether they had it down to six or down to eight, so it was 10 points and then either, you know, accordingly. Um, and that, I think that'd be quite good. I think, great, have that. We'll get a bit more risk reward, a bit more colour to the midfield battle as well, especially with the new regs now where it's not a complete washout in terms of just one or two cars. Yes, there are still some quicker ones, but it's not as cut and dry. Um, so I'd be, I'd love for them to try that. That that would be really interesting. So yeah, that is the uh, format that you've suggested on your hot lap video from last year. So if anyone wants to go and see it in its entirety, I go and check out Ash's video on that. It's actually a really good watch. And there's other hot lap videos that you've done, which are also very interesting and extremely passionate in some cases. Um, so on the, the reverse grid, obviously you said there's a bit of opposition to it. And I think any reverse grid is going to have opposition as long as it has a massive influence on the championship. So if you can then sort of detach qualifying and the Grand Prix from the sprint and link them back to together, keep the sprint as its own thing. But again, still award points because then if a driver performs well in one of those lower midfield teams, they can collect some valuable points. And that just means everyone scores points. People get that prize money. And that that's important because the knock on effects, I've, as I've spoken about on the show before, you know, it doesn't just stop at Toto Wolf and Lewis Hamilton and the team principals. It goes down to the mechanics. It drips back down into the data guys at the factories. You know, the people who are chefs and work, who clean the factories. You know, there was a, I think it was on Mark Priestley's podcast. He said about the guy who cleans at NASA. People ask him what he does. Is he a cleaner or does he send rockets to the moon? You know, that that's what we're dealing with here. People have livelihoods and you don't know how far these things go and you look at the way manor and caterham sort of just disappeared off the grid very quickly offering up opportunities to score points even if it's in a sprint race 
is really important actually for those lower midfield teams because it gives them opportunity to be at the front and get and get the the kudos that comes for it because they spend a lot of time at the back and you know at the moment Williams tend to find themselves at the back and only really on the telly if Albon manages a miraculous point or Latifi throws it at the wall. And we used to hear it all the time, all the teams want the sponsors, the TV coverage, the TV coverage, all, all, all of that. So I think your idea actually balances everything really, really well. It's a really, really good idea to sort of detach things and then use the, the Friday quality because that still stands as its own thing, has its own merits. It keeps everything sort of linked together. It gives every day something important. It gives every person who attends value for their ticket but it keeps that the essence of the championship yeah absolutely and you know i think one of the biggest oppositions to to reverse grid races is oh it's it's you know fabricated it's you know it's it's trying to manufacture stuff it's like well yeah but you know qualifying used to be an hour long and it only really kicked off in the last five or ten minutes or if there was you know changeable weather conditions the, we have the system we have now so it can be a little bit more entertaining and fabricated everything is kind of done in a way so we get this mix of sport versus entertainment and if this was just par for the course it wasn't just dotted in and about that's just the championship you know that's the kind of that's the course you lay ahead of it you know play to the whistle do what you can with what's what's there um so yeah, I, I think it'll be a really good way. And the point you make about like for those midfield teams and lower down teams to give them a, a chance for glory. And, and so, yeah, that's a huge point. I couldn't agree more with that. And on, while we're on the subject of uh, formats of the sprint, so obviously George Russell suggested it could be a bit longer. So obviously we, we had a chat last week over Twitter um, where we, we were very polite to each other. No one was throwing any mud. It was very all amicable, amicable, which was great. And that's why we love Twitter. Um, so should the, the sprint be longer? At the moment, it's about 30 minutes. And if you think about it, what it's replacing, and I've thought about this. So you lose a practice session, which is 60 minutes at the moment. And then it goes, the sprint goes in place of a 60 minute qualifying hour, or in Imola's case, a two hour qualifying hour with all the red flags so you're not actually getting as much track time as you think you're getting more competitive track time which yes is great but it's not actually as much you know i'm sitting there for half an hour i'm like oh yeah let, let's let's go and then just as a, but everything like i said earlier reaches boiling point you know what do you do with it so at the moment, it's 100 uh, kilometres. Could it be 150 kilometres? Could it be 45 minutes plus one lap? These are the sort of things that we should be seeing trialled. You know, one should be 150. They shouldn't be, uh, if you're trialling it, maybe don't do it for championship points. But I don't know, maybe do it for um, extra budget cap or something. That would get the teams motivated to do well, wouldn't it? <laughs> That's a whole different kettle of fish. I mean, what, what would you say to 150Ks or a 45-minute plus one, a bit like a Formula E race? Well, as someone who is a fan of Formula E, I love the idea of 45-minute plus one. I think that's a good length of a race where it is still a sprint, but even in those lengths of like Formula E races, you do get a little bit of strategy in there as well, um, mainly because for them for, from attack mode. So I don't think you necessarily get it the same, but you would still have enough time to think okay there could be some tired deck here or do i need to save fuel um and just you know so i think 45 plus one just extends it just enough that it's not encroaching on a full grand prix um but you can let things run and play out a bit longer and then you do get a real value for it because to be honest i watch a formula e race which is 45 minutes plus one and think cool good weekend yeah. good race I, we're done and um to, to have that in formula one and then be like oh guess what tomorrow we're going to do it again for two hours awesome you know that's so yeah i think that's a good a little extension of it and um you know it fixes uh what george said as well so i, I quite like that I'm, I'm quite a fan of the way formula e sort of brings a strategy in with that 45 plus one because you've always got that that jeopardy of actually how long is this race going to be how many laps is it going to be there's not a defined there is a defined distance 
Um, but it's not like, oh, it's 25 laps today. You've got to achieve 25 laps to, to win the race. You don't know whether it's 23, 24, 25, 26, or 27. How hot is the pace going to be? The guy at the front could manage the pace and then disappear, and you've got to try and catch him. And, it, you know, they might have brought the lap count down, so you might not have so long to do it. So it's there's that balancing act and that strategy between the drivers and with the teams. And they've got to sort of play chicken with each other. We've, we've seen a chicken with DRS this year. I mean, let's throw some more at it. It would be really interesting to see how the top drivers handle that. It just adds another element to the way you have to conduct yourself in the car and how you have to prepare out of it, which would be really interesting. And obviously 150 kilometers, I think it just gives you more racing and I'm down for more racing. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think it would be good as well if you gave them the teams, the control over like, okay, it's going to be this amount, but because it's not like you say a defined length, it's like, right. How much fuel do we put in? You know, how, you know, like you say, there is still in the same way that you have energy management, there's a little bit of fuel management going on as yes. well um, with, with that. So I, I think, yeah, that would be really fun. And, and like you say, they said when they introduced sprints, what, these are experiments, we're going to experiment. They've done very little to tweak it since, apart from add a few more points and change the name of, you know, the, what you get on Friday. Um, so yeah, let's see. Let's tweak a bit more. Go experiment a bit more with it. Absolutely. There was one idea that I, I've had for a while, which is to give a sprint specific tyre. So whether Pirelli bring out a secret tyre, which the teams don't know that what they're going to get. So it's just it's one of the compounds that's there on the weekend, but it's unbranded. So all it has is Pirelli on it in like a, I don't know, make it bright pink or something. So you don't know whether it's a soft, a medium or a hard from that from that weekend. So the driver then has to work out what they've actually got. And, you know, if you underdrive it to start with, you might suffer with graining. If you overdrive it, your tyres might just fall apart and all of a sudden you have drivers having to pit. So it, it could just throw a complete um, random into it, which, you know, for a driver who nails it, Okay, there's a little bit of luck and a little bit of fortune, but you've got to work out how to get the best out of your tires. And you've got to then read the data. The driver then has to be sort of light on his feet to, to react to what's going on. A driver who is able to read the situation, take Fernando Alonso, always a step ahead of the game, always knows what's going on. That might play into his hands. Or you bring out an actual tire that is specific for the sprint that the teams all know and they get a chance to use it in practice. And then they can sort of work with it from there. And it's something that maybe does do the full distance. Maybe it doesn't do the full distance. And then you've got to manage it and you've got to look after it. So there's, there's different ways. And like we say, you've got to experiment. And we've only seen one format so far, which is kind of disappointing. Yeah, it is. And I, I love that. I love the idea of giving them just a, a mystery tire, as it were. Like it could, because obviously Pirelli kind of make the choice. Um, and it's still like, what, C see well i don't know what the numbers are now isn't like one two three four or five one three four five so there's no reason why they could like select um one of those or they could literally go one in the other direction or they don't always select in sequence do they as well so they could easily pick a compound in between yeah and just give them and i love that because that's then on the driver and the team in the moment to work it out like compared to what they know in practice for the driver to feel it out that would be really really fun and the thing that i think you know f1 they get they get so much data now so they're able to prepare and learn so much and i think being able to give them a little bit less of it where they have it is about their skill and their ability to kind of think on the fly it's a bit more on the drivers i i, I love that as an idea i would i'd be up for not giving them it in practice at all and be like it's going to be a pirelli tire you'll have used it at some point in the season maybe yeah. not this weekend to work out what it is yeah exactly but you know so i'm i'm very much up for that so yeah it just yeah it would be great for them to try like ross braun going back to him was one of the great innovators of of you know the sport i'd love to see him do it a bit more in his role now because i think it's what it's crying out for definitely yeah absolutely and the thing is i think uh some of those super hard tires from sort of like 2013 are knocking about still they were never used you know throw them at it why not 
Oh yeah, exactly. Why not? And yeah, I think there's so much potential in it. And as much as I'm kind of at the minute in its current form, if it was a choice of have this or nothing, I'd be like, nothing, please. I th- I'd prefer the way it was. It's not broken. But at the same time, there is still potential in this. And I'd be happy for them to try and try it, you know, try out a bit more. Um, and as much as we kind of said, look, the, the FIA kind of needs to be open to criticism when it's valid. I don't think any of us do it because we like complaining. I think we all do it because we want to see a better Formula One. Of course, and we, we love I think, what we see. And absolutely. It's not do to it do because it. you love it. Yeah, exactly. And it's not to do it to kind of be negative or to be down on the FIA. I do, and you know, there are people out there who just love complaining for the sake of it. I don't. I want to love this sport. And I do, well, I do love this sport, but I want to kind of love everything about it. And when you see a wasted potential, you want to be like, come on, guys, there's a chance here. Let's let's go for it. So, yeah. And I said this at the end of my hot lap video. I feel like we've solved it. And I feel like, you know, Ross Braun knows where to find us. Um, so and I, I'll send I him a link feel, to the podcast. <laughs> exactly. It's just like Ross, you know, we, you know, we're fans of your days, you know, back. I love Braun and Ferrari. It's great. You just let's talk it out. You know, we've got it. Just have a round table over Zoom. It'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah. And then if we have to go to a Grand Prix or two just to talk it through further, that's fine as well. I'm I'll stay okay here because I'm scared that. of flying. And so, unless it's really, Silverstone. Oh, okay. Let's, yeah, Silverstone. Silverstone's Silverstone's dead. Dead. I can drive there. It's fine. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't send me to australia I, I have actually been to australia which is a like on a random topic nothing to do with formula one i always say to people i'm terrified of flying oh but yeah but i've been to australia they're like what <laughs> how did you manage that was it a very long boat trip or i uh, know it was a plane i oh. actually watched uh actually watched the uh, uh sort of a shortened version of the 2014 abu dhabi grand prix on the fl- on the first flight so that got oh. me through i was like oh yay formula one woohoo <laughs> Yeah, keep me distracted. Yeah, we, we could get we could get the ferry to the Le Castellet or mainland Europe. Oh yeah, I can deal with that. Be fine. There's loads of other Grand Prix we could do. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, so that are that they that are English, Aaron. Come on, words, <laughs> grammar. <laughs> um, so they are our thoughts on how we could fix the sprint format and just our general thoughts about its place within formula one as a sport let us know your thoughts on the sprint format uh you can find us on twitter uh what's your twitter handle ash just for anyone who am... wants to find you oh that's a great question i think i'm at outside line yt um off the top of my head because i'm it. really clever and don't have the same handle for everything <laughs> I, do, I do have it written down here it's at outside line underscore yt so close very close um so we're going to move on now to, and this, is, this isn't by design, uh, this is just a coincidence, the sprint finish to the episode. So whenever I have a guest on, I want to fire some questions to them that they have not seen in advance. And basically, I want, to, I want your first answer that comes to mind, Ash. Uh, so okay. I've got five questions, and they're all to do with the 2022 season. Some of them may age uh, badly quite quickly. Uh, because like I said earlier, we're recording between practice and qualifying for Miami. Uh, so one of them is about uh, someone's win. So, you know, it could change by tomorrow, uh, which okay. could be yesterday by the time you're hearing this. <laughs> so um, let's crack on with the sprint finish. So the first question is, who has the better overall package, Ferrari or Red Bull? Ferrari, definitely. Do you, want, do you want me to expand on how quick you can it is? Stand on that if you want to. You can stand so, yeah, on that if you want to. I mean, they're quite evenly matched on pace. Reliability is a huge difference. And we've seen it over the course this weekend. Again, it's kind of struck for Red Bull. Um, and, you know, yes, Red Bull kind of pulled maybe the upper hand at Imola, but they brought their first upgrade package. Ferrari have finally brought theirs this weekend. So for me, it's, it's Ferrari. I think they're pretty even, but reliability kind of definitely sways it more. Ferrari and Leclerc man to beat. Well, that's Verstappen getting pole in half an hour by a second. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, so second question, which car has the best looking livery? Oh, oh I, I, I hate to kind of do the same answer again. That Ferrari is so good. 
like it is a proper throwback to the early 90s of the Ferraris that Alacy even mm-hmm. drove to kind of bring it a little bit full circle. It's so, so simple, so nice. And considering the messes of liveries that we saw from like the weird sort of fades that we had on last year's with this, the splash of green. Um, yeah, this year they've absolutely nailed it. That Ferrari is a beautiful car. It does look mean, doesn't it? And, you know, it looks as fast as it is, which is great. Yeah. Question three, then. Will Mick Schumacher score a point this season? I think he will. Um, I think he will, because, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns coming through this season as, as uh, you know, teams upgrade, We you know, kind of feel things out. They go to these tracks for the first time with these regs. Um, I think he'll get better. Um, obviously, he's kind of been shown up a little bit by Kev at the minute. Um, but to be fair, Kevin Magnussen has long been a great driver and has got a lot of experience. It is still only Mick's second season yeah. in F1. Um, and I think everyone is kind of expecting everything from him because of the name. And some people call him a name merchant. I think that's slightly unfair. He may not be to the level that I think, you know, people would love him to be for that kind of continuity of father and son. Uh, but he's not a slouch by any means. So, right, I think there might be a track where things might click for him, might get a bit of luck, but I think there's, yeah, loads of opportunities, so I think he will score. Well, I don't think he'll outscore Kev, but he'll, he'll score points, definitely. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think maybe a more sensible target for him first is to actually beat the uh, career record of his uncle, Ralph. That might be a more yes. realistic target. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, so question four, uh, which this, this could age very bad, well, oh, just, no. just be out the, out the window very quickly. Who gets their maiden win first, George Russell or Carlos Sainz? <laughs> okay, this may, this may age horribly. I think it's actually going to be George Russell. Because um, even though, oh, yeah, I'm going to stick with that. I think there's promise shown in that Mercedes. Yes, it, there was more promise yesterday than there was today. They're back down mm. in 12th. But the consistency that George Russell has shown, even in that poor car, has been incredible. And there will be times where I think Mercedes have been so good and they work so tirelessly, it will click. And they may not be in a title fight this year, but they will. I'm sure they will have a race-winning car come the second half of the season. Uh, so I think, yes, George will do it. Now you think, well, hang on, Ferrari have a race winning car now, but Carlos Sainz is going through, I think, he's kind of, a, he's going through kind of his roughest patch as an F1 driver. Um, he's been so kind of cool, calm and collected, the smooth operator, wherever he goes. Now he's in a race winning car. He's got a championship rival uh, as a teammate. And I think it's just kind of spooked him a little bit. Um, so it's kind of who's going to get the, get it together first, Carlos Sainz's head or the Mercedes F1 team. Um, and I'm going to back Mercedes over Carlos. Um, but that's confirmed Carlos Sainz winning in Miami tomorrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he's either, poor Carlos is going to come out of this either as a future world champion or he's going to come out as like a Barrichello Weber sort of guy who bad things always happen to. And it, someone's going to do a video like in 10 years or oh, a series of unfortunate events, Carlos Sainz edition. Maybe, maybe he's the new John Lacey. Maybe it's, maybe it's him. It could. Maybe that's what will happen. He'll win yeah. one race. Um, maybe he'll win Canada have, this year. Yeah. that might, Imagine. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll stick some money on that. That could be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Please gamble responsibly. Yes. yes. Uh, but yeah, that'd be interesting. <laughs> and then the final question. Who becomes 2022 Formula One world champion? It's hard not to look past Leclerc at the minute. I think Mm -hmm. Verstappen is doing incredibly well when the car's with him. Um, But the reliability is, you know, he's he's got a gap to kind of make up to begin with. The reliability has been poor. um, And there's no guarantee when they're on track. Like Leclerc has kind of outdone him once uh, at Bahrain. Yes, he got him back at at Saudi and... and, um, also at Imola, but yeah, I just, I I think Charles, despite his spin in Imola, he'll, that, I think he's a good learner. I think he will take it and develop, and I think a lot of the learning that Max could have done last year, 
he'll do this year. Mm. I think he'll kind of have a bit of humbling. I think Max will go on to win more world championships, assuming that Red Bull, um, you know, remain a competitive force in the sport. Um, but I think this year is is Charles definitely. Well, I must say, I've been super. Imp- <laughs> <laughs> I've been super impressed with Charles. I mean, obviously, I knew he was always a good driver, but sometimes you only see just how good these exceptional drivers really are when you give them an exceptional car that's sort of worthy of their talent. And we're seeing that with Charles now. And you see like c- certain drivers like Carlos Sainz, they excel in cars that are upper or sort of middle of midfield. And they're able to bag those podiums when they're on offer, maybe sneak a win, but you put them in a race winning car and sometimes it just doesn't go their way. And I'm not saying that Carlos Sainz for a moment isn't ready to be a world champion. I absolutely think he is. I actually tipped him to be second uh, this season to Hamilton so that's aged very well <laughs> so I mean what do I know but like with Leclerc I was watching him on board uh, around Miami and through the chicane okay the, the Ferrari is probably handling very well but he's just making it look so easy you know and it, it, the car control is fantastic and he's able to go to the limit and like you say he, he learns from his mistakes he he makes mistakes and you know he says he's that he's stupid but he doesn't make that same mistake twice which I think is a really good trait to have you can make a mistake and everyone is allowed a mistake or two within a season. It's just how you learn from them. And that's what Lewis Hamilton has done for years. He's made like the odd error, learned from it. He learned from his experience with Rosberg and he'd have le- he's learned from his experiences with Verstappen. So it's only fair that we allow other drivers to do the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's as much as you think, well, you know, Max has gotten over the line and he's done it. You think that gives him an upper hand, but, you know, He's an inc- Charles is so incredibly confident and um, incredibly talented um, and they've raced each other for a long time. So it's going to still feel very familiar to him. So, yeah, I it's hard to look past him. I don't think the championship fight's over by any stretch. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's going to be his this year. And to be fair, it, you know, I for many years grew up being like, oh, Ferrari winning everything. Oh, I don't want to see him win. It's a nice refreshing change where I actually I must say it's, it's refreshing. I'm a Ferrari it? fan. Yeah. I was like, yeah, go on Ferrari. Go on. <laughs> I was sitting, I was sitting down the other day, the other day and I'm thinking I've got to write an episode where it looks like a confession. I think I'm coming in. I was a Ferrari fan. <laughs> yeah. I have to write an apology to my mum because she hates Ferrari. Oh really? Oh wow! I mean, neither of us liked uh, Schumacher growing up when I, when I was growing up, and we were always McLaren fans. Mika Hakkinen and David Coulthard, likewise. Uh, yeah, yeah. A pointless fact. I mean, I saw a Hayton Coulthard uh, haulage van drive past my house the other day, which is David right. Coulthard's family business. I did not know that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, I'll be on the lookout for those now. Everywhere yeah, I go, they're like bright red, and they've got the Scottish saltire on them. So. They're oh, that's going to be like my annoying dad fact. Every time I see one, it's going to be like, <laughs> hey, guys, do you know that is uh, <laughs> that, that lorry? That's David Coulthard's family business. <laughs> oh, <they've, laughs> I'm gonna like, oh he's trying that one out again. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to annoy people for life with that. So thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. It's all yours. <laughs> and it's yours. If you're listening to this episode, we've reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much, Ash, for joining me. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, chatting to you i'm sure we'll do this again at some point soon i mean i'm finishing almost in career 2010 levels of darkness i should have got my my halo light out um i've i've been doused by the sun for the whole thing so it's, it's fine it's balancing out it's balancing out yeah. um follow me on twitter at five underscore red underscore lights and ash where can we find the outside line and where can we follow you on twitter so you can follow me on Twitter and I practice with got a reminder outside outside line underscore YT on Twitter or the outside line on YouTube. Excellent. And make sure you catch up with Ash's uh, current project, which I believe is 1997 and Olivier Panis. It is. Uh, yeah. So we have just passed the halfway point of the season. Um, there is some uh, incredible consistency from Jacques Villeneuve and Michael Schumacher. Uh, but when we, you know, we're, we're in amongst it, trying to give uh, Panis and his, uh, the one good Prost Grand Prix car um, a little bit of justice. Are you, are you allowed to call him Jacques Villeneuve or do you have to call him Williams driver number one? I have renamed him. Obviously, Murray still calls him Williams driver number one. In the, so it's just <laughs> Williams number one. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> 
bless him. So yeah, he's uh, I still call him Jack, but uh, yeah, his his Williams driver spirit lives on. Brilliant. Well, make sure you go and subscribe to the Outside Line if you haven't already. It's a brilliant uh, channel to what to be uh, a viewer of, and Ash is a fantastic host. He, the, the comment, the commentary, and the the the, the narrator is fantastic it has me in stitches every episode so make sure you go and sub to that thank you for listening to this episode i hope you enjoyed the miami grand prix i mean oh what a, what a win it was for whoever i mean we don't know so, probably carlos Sainz. yeah probably carlos Sainz. now that we've said all that about him poor guy i mean bumped his head spun into the wall yeah fix it with a victory um and we will see you when the five red lights go out <laughs>